In this episode, I was interviewed by Amal Narayanan, host of the Soft Matter Show, and he graciously allowed me to cross-post the content on YouTube and my podcast. So I would really uh, suggest that you go subscribe to uh, Amal's show, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Today we have Dr. Darren Lipomi here at the Soft Matter Show. Darren is a professor of nanoengineering, at the University of California, San Diego. Darren is an expert in engineering physical properties of polymers for sensors and haptic devices. But more importantly, Darren has a tremendous online footprint. The Darren Lipomi YouTube channel has like 10,000 plus subscribers and his podcast series, The Molecular Podcasting, is one of the highest downloaded podcasts in the chemical engineering genre. And he has an outstanding phenomenon. He has a, he has an outstanding personality, and he talks a lot about the issues in the academies, academicians, and also about talks about the advices for students in his podcast show. With that introduction, let's hear from Darren. Welcome to the Soft Matter Show, Darren. Thanks, Amal, for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's so much fun to have you here, actually. So, one of the first questions that I normally ask—I mean, I, I don't get to ask this very often—but you have this experience of traveling all over the places right you have been you grew up in the in the in rochester up, upstate new york if i'm right then you moved to boston for your undergrad and phd then you moved all the way to to um, west coast for your postdoc as well as as a faculty so what 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 are your thoughts on working in the west coast versus east coast and what are your suggestions for students that's a big a big question that has uh, many, uh, many answers. Um, so I grew up in a town called Hilton, which is northwest of the city of Rochester in western New York State. Uh, Hilton itself is, it, Rochester itself is very, uh, very diverse. It has a, a strong history in the civil rights movement. So for example, uh, uh, Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass did a lot of their important work there, and they're actually uh, buried at Mount Hope Cemetery, which is the first uh, municipal cemetery in the United States. Uh, but Hilton itself, uh, 20, 25 minutes northwest, is um, is kind of like a small small town America. It's it has uh, cornfields in every direction. Um, I was uh, I was born there, though my family, you know, is is basically a, a Rochester family. But I was born and, and grew up in Hilton. Um, and uh, culturally, what I what I notice is that uh, despite the uh, the um, uh, homogeneity and the uh, the the trumpiness of the uh, of the, the the space between big cities in America is uh, is uh, friendliness and uh, you know it's hard to pay for the type of customer service that you get at a McDonald's or Starbucks or uh, or CVS in uh, in the in in small town America and even in you know places that are that that you pay a lot more for customer service you don't you don't really get it as as much. I can completely like the... understand that point, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Moving from Midwest to, to New Jersey, I can see that complete difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's unbelievable the way that the way that this works. Um, and then I moved to, uh, to to Boston. So every every move I made, the uh, the weather got a little bit better. So the weather's a little bit better in in Boston. Uh, the there's a kind of like a hard nosed, uh, hard working type attitude of uh, people in academia and administration in the Northeast. So I did my undergraduate degree at Boston University and my PhD at Harvard. Uh, then I, I moved to uh, to Stanford and in Northern California, it's a little bit, uh, there, there's some aspects of the Northeast that are in, uh, in the Bay Area. Um, there's a little bit of a hard driving culture, but not nearly as much. Uh, you didn't have as many uh, people working nights and weekends in the lab, and I'm not going to make a value judgment about that right now. It's just what I observed. Um, and then Southern California is um, is very uh, um, it's very relaxed, and that may be a euphemism uh, for <laughs> for some maybe characteristics that make someone who grew up and did their schooling in a in the northeast i uh, feel like maybe they have a little bit of an advantage <laughs> so in terms of the work culture like when you're working in the lab you, you said like there's more of a relaxed schedule uh in the in the uh, in the california side like that's what you felt like so what do you think is a perfect style for 
an academician or a PhD student to follow? I think a little bit of it depends on the field. There are some a uh, there are some fields where the lab and the library have a complementary um, uh, relationship, where the library is go is where you go to do research on knowledge that exists, and the lab is where you go to collect knowledge uh, that do that doesn't exist yet, and you you uh, achieve it through experimentation. There are some fields, however, that are so lab intensive. Um, organic synthetic chemistry is a good example where you really can't make any headway at all unless you're willing to put 10 to you know 13 hours a day and it's not uh, it's not necessarily the, uh, the, the, the healthiest uh, field to be in in terms of work-life balance but it, there there are huge differences in the amount of time that it actually takes to, to get something out of the lab. So I would say that like um, there are some labs, some some types of workflows where the uh, where the the relaxed uh, uh, attitude lends itself better, is more consistent uh, with that type of attitude. And I think um, I think the field of um, you know some amount of device work and some uh, some you know, laboratory intensive experimentation, but not to the extent of organic synthesis is something that maybe works well in SoCal, uh, whereas in the Northeast, maybe uh, maybe the more lab intensive things are, are more uh, congruent with the culture there. And this is stuff I haven't focus group tested. I've, I'm speaking these words for, the, for the, the, the first time, and I hope you don't get a lot of uh, Twitter rage for, for having said that, but that's just my observation. I think I think I mean I I asked this question in my previous guests uh, guests as well like Niels Holton he was he's, he was a UCSB PhD student and then he moved to Chicago then he, he's working right now at MIT so he has like the similar philosophy that you were talking about uh, when he worked you know across the country that that is exciting that there's a commonality between the opinions of two different people so yeah i'm taking my data points from random places yeah i think i think the fields that that i would most like to work in are those that allow work-life balance right so so where you are treating the lab like the library except you're going to go in there for targeted purposes to get the information that you need yeah that's perfect so since you brought up the topic of organic chemistry like i i'm, I'm i know i'm aware that you started your research as a synthetic organic chemist right so how did you inspire yourself to transform your career from a chemist to a electronics engineer, I would say? How, how do you think, how, how did you make that transition? I think there are a couple of vectors along which one might optimize their career trajectory. One is, what are you good at? And what, what, can, what gets you what are the what are the problems where you go into or what are the topics where you go into a class and you're you feel good at it the you you're maybe toward the the higher end of the grade distribution in the class you have a lot of passion for the material maybe you've never heard of it before you took the class but you kind of like it for me organic chemistry was was like that i didn't know anything about it before i took it but i felt like i could personify functional groups and atoms and molecules and intermolecular forces and synthetic steps. I like the puzzle as the puzzle building aspect of it. Um, it was a very straightforward type of a problem for me to solve. I like the forensic aspect of it too. So you have some colorless oil and how do you know the structure of it? If it has a molecular weight of 300 grams per mole, you know, some combination of NMR and IR and mass spectrometry allow you to, to deduce deduce the structure. I liked all that, but it didn't, it, that wasn't the problem that got me out of bed in the morning, which was more like um, energy applications or um, uh, or human machine interfaces and not even so much human machine interfaces, but rather uh, rather uh, human perception and cognition in ways that could be probed by materials and engineering uh, phenomena. So, but I didn't have any expertise in that. So when I think when I thought of energy, I thought of or clean energy, I thought of windmills and nuclear power and solar cells that are made from inorganic semiconductors that that, you know, involve quantum phenomena and solid state uh, material science, solid state physics that I, I don't have the background in. And frankly, I don't have the adeptness 
for. There are a lot of people out there that are better at that stuff than I am, but I got pretty good at organic synthesis as an undergraduate. Um, I had two first author papers in my undergraduate lab in like straight up organic synthesis. And then I thought, okay, that's gonna be my ticket into this these other problems that I that get me out of bed. <laughs> like I don't I don't think about synthetic problems. I think about synthesis as a tool that I can use to uh, to make progress in these other fields that really have a deep spiritual uh, connection uh, in uh, in in me. Yeah, I think that's a very good point because if you think about it, like there are there would be like an undergrad student like sitting in the sitting in the lab or sitting in the office and thinking that okay, I want to work on something very cool. I want to work on astrobiology or like, you know, fields which sounds very cool. And it's, but the, the way to there would be, uh, could be very hard for people from a very diverse background. So I think, yeah, the point you are making is that you try to, to learn something and you get the routine of working and get better at it. Once you get that opportunity, then you can transform yourself to the field that you could contribute to and the one which can get you out of your bed. That is an excellent point that you're making. Yeah. So I think the same for me, actually, like in, if you think, think about like I started as a the organic, uh, pure synthesis, like, you know, uh, CC coupling, CH activation and things like that. But now I work in some, something completely different, which I think I'm more passionate about, but the, the, the work culture and the way, we work together is similar to or learn i learned everything from the organic synthesis lab which is like it's amazing so that's cool i didn't i didn't realize that we had that uh, similar background that's interesting i mean i started as a conducting polymer in a conducting polymer group which is like hardcore on you know synthesizing p3st like molecules or like you know thiophene based materials but yeah now it changed a lot and i don't think i can go back and redo that but i still have the the work culture which I learned from there which I think helps me even in the in this current situations even though I'm working on very extremely different things yeah that's cool so, so since we are talking we are talking about the human machine interface and I think it's, this is a perfect time to to learn more about what you actually do in the lab so can you tell me about some of the recent findings that actually keeps you wakes you up and like you know I want to work on this what what is that one of those problems which you are trying to work on right now yeah, I'll give you a uh, brief introduction to, to what we do. We, we're interested in the mechanical properties of electronic polymers. And those are uh, in, uh, that is uh, mechanical properties of, of static polymers and also uh, the uh, ways in which they might be stimulus responsive. The particular class of materials that we do the most work in is uh, pi conjugated polymers. So those are conducting and semiconducting polymers. Um, but we're not, uh, we're at this point, we're kind of like, uh, we're not tied to a particular class of materials. We also do a lot of, uh, of uh, of chemistry based on materials that can be made by controlled radical polymerization strategies and, and, and so on. So within this core scientific area, so what are the structural, the microstructural and molecular structural characteristics that give rise to the mechanical properties of the, these materials? We have three sort of broad project areas. One is uh, application of these materials to solar photovoltaics and in mostly organic solar cells, but we've been interested in perovskite and perovskite organic and silicon uh, tandem and hybrid cells as well. Another area is the use of organic electronic materials in mechanical biosensors. So both uh, cellular uh, electrophysiological sensors and also uh, wearable uh, mechanical sensors. And in particular, we've been working with, uh, with CK Cheng's group um, in, uh, in, in computer science uh, and engineering at UCSD on machine learning to, uh, to, uh, to do what I would call bi-directional communication with a wearable device. So it, it, might, uh, it, it might take a physiological signal, then do some computation, then give you a haptic signal backward, back to you. And that leads me to the third 
uh, project area, which is haptics. And there are a lot of uh, haptics have been interesting to have, a lot of people have been interested in haptics. Um, it is, uh, you know, for, for listeners who, who might not be aware, it's basically the, uh, the use of, of technologies to manipulate the sense of touch um, and to produce new tactile sensations. So there's really a lack of, of uh, haptic sensations available in off-the-shelf materials. So what we're trying to do is uh, is access types of tactile sensations like moisture, tack, uh, thermal conductivity, uh, near surface texture, near surface softness that are really difficult to recapitulate using off-the-shelf actuators that just depress into the skin. So most things just shake and vibrate and press into the skin. They have a very limited uh, suite of functionality. But if we have organic materials that can reconfigure their properties um, in real time, we think we can access a much larger gamut of, of, uh, of properties for applications in surgical training, physical therapy, uh, robotic assisted surgery, telemedicine, and uh, and those types of applications. Um, I don't want to talk for too long. I want to make sure that I get. I want to make sure that I get the uh, to to like our most recent like exciting findings. But I'm happy to talk about any one of those areas, and I can sort of tell you what I think the most important thing we've done. Yeah, the, the the amount of time you spent on that three sections, I can feel that the haptics is some part you can, you are like very much more passionate about in pursuing in the future. So my question would be like, what are your goals in terms of haptics? Like, you know, when would you be like happy? Okay, this is what I wanted to do. This is what I, I did. So when would that, what what would that be? What would that achievement would be when you would be like, oh, yeah, this is a this is a significant contribution that I have done. I'm interested in materials approaches to haptics in both the, the basic scientific uh, uh, sense to understand more about human perception and, and, uh, and cognition, but and, and also the forward facing direction of being able to develop new haptics technologies. Now, of course, you can't do the latter without the former. And uh, we, we and, and this probably leads to one of the more significant scientific discoveries that my lab uh, has made. Um, for example, we showed that it is possible for, uh, for human participants to differentiate surfaces based on surface energy differences uh, created by molecular monolayers. Um, uh, in a later uh, paper, we showed that uh, that the sense of softness that one feels in a uh, in a solid material can be manipulated by the uh, by the porosity and the indentation depth of the material and not in really an obvious way in fact the more porous the surface if you keep the indentation depth uh, constant the harder it actually feels which is kind of counterintuitive um, and in particular the features of the porosity are actually smaller than the spacing between mechanoreceptors and the skin, which suggests some type of, of hyperacuity or like super resolution in the, uh, in the, the fingertip. And so that's, uh, that hadn't been shown before. I think it would, be, would have been hard to, uh, to show without, uh, without the lab's expertise in, uh, in microfabrication. And we had a, um, an outstanding postdoc, Charles Dong, who's now an assistant professor at uh, University of Delaware in material science, um, who, who really brought the, this project uh, forward. Um, and that's, uh, that's the type of fundamental contribution I would like to make to human perception. So that was softness, but you can imagine that there are other types of, uh, of transitive properties that exist on these one-dimensional axes where you can dial in. So we showed it was possible to dial in the sense of surface softness. So this is the contact area and indentation depth that you need to, uh, to, to, to have a material that occupies some position on this softness number line. But the same thing probably exists for tack 
and sliminess and adhesion and things that we have a good material science def uh, definition for, but we don't have a good material science plus perception and cognition definition for and also linguistic issues work their way in there uh, as well like one person soft might not be the same as another person soft and also what soft in one language might not be the same thing as soft in another language so these are all things that are really ph philosophically interesting to me um, and then in the long term i'll just spend like two sentences on this uh, where we really are interested in integrated devices in uh, in gloves and wearable technology that can interface in virtual and augmented environments. So our our um, our uh, most recent paper on this was the use of a conductive polymer um, using an intermittent electrotactile signal that could simulate a sense of of roughness and smoothness. And we showed that it was possible for participants to separate the roughness and smoothness in the face of conventional vibrotactile signals, which uh, simulated like surface hardness and also thermoelectric devices, which could heat up and cool down. Um, so that that uh, maybe is, is, you know, it involves a lot of technological sophistication for a material science group to be able to do something like that. I mean, for a robotics group, it would be very easy. But for us, it was like a, a, a huge investment um, to, to be able to integrate materials into like a wireless uh, wearable platform that could do this in real time in VR. So proud of that. That that is very exciting because if you if you would have been an undergrad like thinking from a chemistry or like when you are doing the synthesis, you would not have thought of coming this forward and thinking about something of a real life technology or even yeah, those, you can feel right. Those are my favorite things, like where you can make something in a flask. Those are the best projects to me. You make something in a flask, you put it in an integrated device, and you get an effect that you that hasn't been demonstrated before. Yeah. And one thing, I mean, just like I'm making it up probably. So if you can, if you can find a way to have a haptic device for NMR, so if you just touch and find out <laughs> what the <laughs> what the product is, that would be fun too. So yeah, just, just, a, just a side note to it. So, yeah, so what does your team look like? Is, is it like, what, what does the expertise or the background of your teammates look like? I work in the Department of Nanoengineering, which is which also houses the Chemical Engineering Program. Our team has uh, ten graduate students and two postdocs and uh, six undergraduates right now. Um, although we're kind of in between the academic years, so it's uh, six to eight, depending on who's coming in and who's coming out. Um, and I think seven of the 10 PhD students are chemical engineers, and then um, uh, maybe maybe six, six of the 10 are chemical engineers, two are nano engineers, and uh, we have an electrical engineer and a material science uh, student. Okay, those numbers are wrong, but it's about it's about that. Two two electrical engineers, one material. Yeah, it's a uh, <laughs> where where do the years go? It's half chemical engineering, uh, you know, twenty percent nano, and then some amount electrical engineering and material science, and then between the the postdocs are both chemists, and the reason is uh, is because it's hard to get uh, chemistry grad students, and it's hard to more it's more that it's hard to give them the training that they deserve because my knowledge of the organic synthetic literature is now like 15 years old <laughs> and i am not going to be a good mentor in stilly and suzuki cross coupling anymore um i can help like does i can help a postdoc with their project particularly in like structure property relationships, but in terms of on the ground advice, I can't really do it. So, um, so or I can't do a good job doing it. So that's why the, the postdoc positions go to synthetic chemists. So when hiring uh, these students or postdocs, what are the things that you look for in terms of a PhDs and postdoc candidates? I look for curiosity first and foremost. I think it, you can't be in science professionally without like an intense sense of 
curiosity and wanting to know how things work. And that is in contrast to an application that I get uh, mostly on the undergraduate side that is, I want to do this for a line on my CV and so that my job application looks more attractive. The no, but it's obvious. But it's but it's it's fairly transparent when you get an email uh, after New New Year's um, from a senior undergraduate that that's the that that's the 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 motivation for the email. Another aspect is trainability, and I think that goes along with curiosity. If somebody's curious, then it it's an implied willingness that they're that they like to change their like mental imprints about their mental models about the way the world works and they'd be they'd be open to uh and receptive to training and even criticism and criticism is is necessary and the third aspect is no uh no assholes <laughs> and so we need we need a uh i like to have a good group culture and uh, culture will actually like trump, um, uh, like I don't know, uh, IQ, whatever that means. You know, sh yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I want the I want to have a climate in the in the lab that is uh, that is diverse and inclusive, and fun and supportive and a climate that supports trust and openness and collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is actually a wonderful point. Like because I, I heard about like curiosity being one of the driver for hiring PhDs or undergrads. But yeah, the trainability is something I never thought of, which is actually true. Like if you are not curious, then you cannot train someone to do something, right? Like I don't always be like a machine who <laughs> like does what, what it does. So let, let me try to switch a gear a little bit towards the the actual part of the show is about the molecular podcasting, right? So you have a huge online imprint. You have you are extremely active in Twitter. You have been you had that YouTube channel since a long time. So what inspired you to start doing or putting contents out online? I've all I've always been interested in the in performance. Um, I consider myself an introverted person in some respects, but on the other hand, I do like teaching. I do like being on stage. Um, I do like uh, video production and now getting more into audio production. When I was a kid, I had this uh, PXL 2000 video camera that would take uh, 20 minutes of black and white video um, on, well, 10 minutes per side on a uh, high definition audio cassette. And this was made by the toy company Fisher Price. So I got that in probably 1988 and I used that as a kid. Then it, when I was 11, I got a, uh, a compact VHS camcorder and I made like claymation videos and I had a Star Trek uh, spoof show called uh, Yummy Trek where we sought out new foods and new civilizations. <laughs> and uh, so, oh. <laughs> so well, my question, did you had friends? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So they, did, they, did you I, show I, this video to anyone or no? Oh yeah, uh, all all my friends made appearances in uh, in these video wow. productions, and we would like we would do it, and we would get we would have pizza and and potato chips, and, and then, <laughs> do you still and have then, those videos? Uh, yes, I, I think I burned oh, wow. into a DVD at some point. <laughs> yeah, you should post it in the YouTube. <laughs> That'd be yeah. fun. Yeah, right. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then, when I got my professor job, I had um, I became very interested. You know, I I really like teaching, and it's not just oh, I like teaching because it pays the bills for nine months, but I'd rather be doing research. No, I really do love teaching and there is so much more you can do if you use if you record all of the boilerplate stuff 
all of the derivations and explanations and use that as a video textbook. So at some point in 2017, actually it was 2017, was the hardcore year of like recording and uploading everything. So I recorded about 90 course lectures, probably ended up being like maybe 70 plus some supplemental videos for the three classes that I was teaching at the time. And the plan was to use those as my video textbook in an active learning flipped classroom type style. Now, active learning flipped classroom, these are terms that, that are thrown around a lot. Uh, the, the active learning methodology where basically there's some pre-assignment and then in class you use that as to do, to do problems in groups where the professor is more of a coach as opposed to a lecturer. Now this whole process lives and dies by the quality and the, the uh, compelling nature of the pre-assignment. If it's just reading a textbook, like that's not that engaging. I mean, we have a textbook for each of the courses that I teach and they, they're an important complement, but it's really hard to get engineering students and natural sciences students to do reading three times a week <laughs> before the class. Uh, maybe history and literature. Yeah, <laughs> history and literature classes, you know, they, it's kind of required, right? If you don't read Moby Dick or whatever before you go into your American literature class, you're going to be completely lost. If you're in a law class or a business class and you haven't read the case before going to class, then you're going to be humiliated when they cold call you. But in engineering and the natural sciences, this is not the norm. Most lectures are incredibly boring and the books are not engaging. I know when I, maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't speak for others. Obviously this is an idiosyncratic thing, but when I was an undergraduate, um, most of the physics classes and physical chemistry classes, like I just, I sat there and thought about other things. The, the, the equations and everything went right over my head and I just knew I wasn't going to understand it until I, uh, I buried my head in the book and did practice problems at the back of the chapter. Um, and most of the lectures were a complete waste of time. And, um, so what I, and I know that sounds harsh now, but they were, I just, and this was in grad school too, like most university lectures are just hideously boring. And most books, most textbooks are hideously boring. And it's really a shame. Uh, I took business classes. I have like a mini MBA from, uh, from the Stanford Grad School of Business. And the lectures were incredibly engaging. And this is how education should be. And a lot of these classes, especially in finance or accounting, it's not as though they're not quantitative. Like it does, it, it takes a lot of like effort <laughs> to, to learn this stuff. And it engages many parts of your, of your brain. And it's taught in a completely different way. And it's better. It's much better. Uh, it's like entertaining to to like, I would take an MBA, I would do an MBA like in a second if I had time just because of how much fun it, it would be. Um, so how do you do the same thing in engineering? Um, you have pre-material that's actually interesting and fun. And so I did these lectures, I recorded them, they, uh, they serve as the basis of my in-person uh, classes. And then in person, it's a variety hour. It's like the, the Colbert rapport. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I, not that I'm like <laughs> as talented as Stephen Colbert, but it's like, you get the idea. We do a lot of different things in the class. There's like, there's problem solving. There's, uh, there's like, uh, sort of role playing. Like you're in a company. This is the design challenge that your customer gave you. How do you, how do you solve it? Um, we do, uh, it's, it's allowed me to rethink assessment. So, um, so, uh, you know, have more frequent contacts with the material and do more frequent quizzes and know more of this like two midterms and a final. And it's like, you know, 25, 25, 50% of your grade. And, uh, and you don't really get that much of a chance to engage. You only really study three times per semester. <laughs> um, and you know, we don't, we don't do that. We, um, we, we break it up. We try to have like an immersive experience and it's really only possible because of, of YouTube. I, I also, um, well, YouTube video 
podcasting, uh, electronic resources. And you were asking about podcasting. I went off on this. No, no, no. I, I actually teaching. want to have a follow up on that, actually. <laughs> so how did that inherent need came to you? Like, I mean, this has been then, like, you know, the way YouTube has been here for like, what, like 20, 15 years, I would say. But nobody has thought about this because every day the, the teachers or the professors are creating content, right? It, but it never comes online. Like if you look for polymer chemistry or polymer physics uh, lectures, you, you probably you are the first one shows up. There was never any other people who tried to attempt to do this. So why this inherent curiosity to do this came to you? Did, did, have you ever thought of that? Yeah, it's. I guess I would develop the my you know my earlier point in a, in sort of a different way. Um, well, first of all, it's it's not entirely correct that I'm the first person to do this. There's like MIT Open Course where there's stuff that out there that has way more hits than I do, and that's not even including like uh, Coursera and Khan Academy. Like Khan Academy is great. The problem is you don't. Yeah, the problem is you don't have a personal relationship with those uh, with those instructors. Whereas if you're on a university campus, you have the resources of like me and the classmates, particularly the classmates um, who you could actually have this like in person session with, which is probably which is more valuable than the videos, right? Because the vi the the classes and having classmates and like live like flesh and blood human beings around you or even on zoom which actually wasn't that bad using this this technique mm -hmm. um that's where the value add is that's what, like why people are paying tuition right because of because of the community um we won't talk about like the signaling effect and sheepskin hypothesis and why it's all just a big racket <laughs> we can talk about that later if you want but anyway how i view it is that is that you know we have each other in the room and we can engage with each other. And that's what makes it different from Khan Academy and Coursera. Now, the um, you had asked about like, just why do it? Why did I do it? Yeah, so uh, so one is to, to make a more like immersive teaching style, uh, to have a more immersive, immersive teaching experience or learning experience for the students. Another thing was really selfish, it's just, much easier for me to do and it plays to my skills and abilities and experience better to run the in-person class session like an engaging uh an engaging variety hour and in particular i don't have to re-memorize all of the derivations again and this is an experience that every professor has where you need to go back through your notes because you forgot like where that factor of two came from in the derivation of the key sum energy and you uh, and <laughs> and thermodynamics notes... would be a troublesome. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly, uh, exactly. And uh, and and is it worth our time given all of the other things that we have to do to like relearn the minutia of teaching um, and uh, a, a, uh, a, a class exactly the same way every time when you can do it once, do it really, really well um, and, and, and know it really well, uh, but not have to like memorize the whole damn thing. <laughs> Yeah. So 2016 is when you, 2017 is when you started doing this, right? So what was the feedback like? So if, if somebody, I'm asking this because if somebody wants to adapt your style of uh, approaching this problem. So what are the differences or in terms of the student's response? Uh, did, did it change at all? Unquestionably changed and unquestionably changed for the better. I think I've had recommend instructor ratings of of a hundred percent in almost every quarter. Uh, we're on the quarter system here. Um, almost every quarter since I started doing this, I think the students think it's believe it's more engaging. I've had to make the tests harder because uh, because they they have more contact points with the material. 
Uh, it is positive. It has improved my life as an instructor in almost every way imaginable. Um, the, the difficulty is that it took a huge upfront investment. For example, the first time you teach a class, you're not going to be very good at it. You may feel good at it at the t you may feel good about it at the time, but the next the second time you do it, it's so much easier. Oftentimes we rewrite our notes, we change something in our approach and then we do it do it the second year and it's better. And then the third year it might be ready to record. <laughs> so and and uh and then you know you know it you know it by heart you can anticipate points of confusion of course i still get challenged by students all the time that's part of the fun of of teaching um but in terms of the uh the comfort level with uh with putting it out there you're you're as good as it as you're as you're gonna be by the third year then you start to asymptote in fact the one class that i have i actually recorded the one class i have that i recorded the first time every year i'm like Got to got to redo the, those those lectures. The other two were like third year or later, um, and then um, yeah. Did I answer the question? Yeah. So well, guys, the the, the advice is that like do, do not try this at home. So <laughs> you, it's it is absolutely worth the effort, but it does take a lot of like a lot of jet fuel to get off the runway for sure. It's not something that somebody could just do immediately but once you have this like body of work that's recorded um you can use it indefinitely um and the podcast actually started as a as an offshoot so also in 20 well in 2016 i became the uh the faculty coordinator for a graduate and postdoc seminar series and that was run by the idea center at the jacobs school of engineering just to give a shout out ideas inclusion diversity excellence and achievement and it's the student services center in the engineering school so i was the faculty coordinator of this this lecture series and there were a variety of professional topics they happened uh six times per quarter so 18 times per year and i would get a speaker from industry or academia or law or government um, and they would speak about a topic. A lot of times there were requests for topics that where I couldn't find a speaker or the speaker canceled. So I would do my best to give those talks and I would spend maybe a week uh, of preparation, you know, not, not, uh, not 40 hours, but, uh, but maybe 15, 20 hours sometimes, like preparing these talks because I enjoyed learning about these, these topics and I would give the talk. And I put them on YouTube and the expectation was that the students who couldn't attend live could watch it anytime they wanted. Now in the era of COVID-19, we call that asynchronously. <laughs> um, and so they could watch it asynchronously. But then people from all over the world actually started, uh, started to watch these videos. Um, and so I started producing more even after I stopped uh, being the director of the uh, of of this talk series, and I was doing uh, episodes on Zoom. Uh, I was doing conversations with people on Zoom. I was doing kind of riffing on topics like that were close to my heart, like uh, like um, uh, grant writing and mental health uh, and anxiety issues, and uh, and speaking to people that could talk about these these issues as well. Um, and all these like peri-scientific topics, so topics that are not necessarily specific to one field, but are specific to the experience of a practicing scientist uh, or academic researcher. So the target audience is really like research interested undergraduates, uh, graduate students, postdocs, and early career faculty. And there's something for almost everybody in in there. Um, I took the those seminars and uh, and videos and just extracted the audio and over the summer um, started the podcast but now when i make an episode it is for the purpose of the podcast and then i also upload the video content um, as well to youtube uh, youtube has a uh, has a 
as a broader reach, but the audience retention isn't as good. So I think once you're in somebody's ear, they don't get all this, all of these distracting, like uh, you might also enjoy kinds of things. And so the audience retention is like 70% on, on the podcast, but maybe 25% on YouTube, even though you get more hits uh, on YouTube, the hits are more uh, committed on the podcast. Yeah, I agree actually, like even for uh, this show, the the retention of audience in in the podcast form is is way higher than what we, I, I see from YouTube most of the times. Um, I think it's probably because the way you, you don't have a lot of things going on in the screen that also can be like distracting for and also like there will be like numerous suggested videos on the side which will also distract you. It's yeah, trying to trying to radicalize us in <laughs> in, in science. I hope. <laughs> so, so what does the future look like for the molecular podcasting? What, 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 where do you want to, where do you want to go with the molecular podcasting in like, you know, a couple of years from now? Recently, I've taken on a uh, leadership role within the idea center at, uh, in the Jacob School of Engineering at UCSD. And that uh, might involve a, uh, a fire, fireside chat series uh, where we talk to, uh, to leaders in STEM education and mentoring and, uh, and inclusion and diversity and perhaps uh, make a, a UCSD branded uh, uh, podcast series based on that work. And that would be a semi-regular uh, occurrence. Molecular podcasting itself will will continue as kind of like my video audio uh, blog, <laughs> and um, I, I it's it, to me it's more than it's more than a it's more than like a video blog because I, I spend a lot of time like preparing these uh, these topics, um, but I, I imagine that most of the interview content would be moved to the new platform which hasn't started yet but stay tuned and uh and the the part that's mainly uh driven by me will stay on molecular podcasting and my uh personal youtube channel but in terms of like subscriber numbers it's it's hard to say like i know i know i'm having an impact i have like uh, I think I have 9,100 subscribers on YouTube now, and the podcast is is hard to judge because you don't know how well like uh, Anchor is actually counting them, but it it probably adds another like thousand or so. Um, but the podcast I just started within the last. Uh, eight, nine months and YouTube, I started in 2017. So it, you know, it, it makes sense. Um, in terms of production values, I don't really have any plans of making myself produce content any, you know, more heavily edited than it already is, which is to say not very much. <laughs> um, and yeah, half the time I skip over all that crap at the beginning <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, it's better for me just to go right into it. Uh, in terms of su subscriber like uh, goals, I think it depends on like what the standard is for book publishers because I'm actually looking, uh, I'm interested in writing a book someday and I would like to have a built-in audience and I'm not exactly sure what subscriber base. I've heard it's like, you know, 10,000 and between, you know, Twitter, Facebook and uh, YouTube and the podcast, I have probably 13, 14,000 followers now. And uh, I don't know if that's good enough in, in the 21st century to get like a book deal. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but that's that's important to me, too. Yeah, I, I'm very curious to know more about that book. So that's one of the things I really wanted to know. What 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 is that book? Um, what is that book content is going to look like? The model for the book is Anthony Bourdain's uh, Kitchen Confidential. And the goal would be to produce a funny account, uh, funny and, and somewhat cutting <laughs> account, somewhat cynical account of the practice of academic and scientific research. Uh, which would have uh, people inside the field um, nodding and chuckling to themselves 
and people outside the field learning. Um, because I think most people in policy and uh, journalism and the reading public have absolutely no idea how science actually gets done at a university. Like, where did the Moderna vaccine come? Where did the BioNTech, um, uh, Oxford, <laughs> BioNTech and Oxford vaccines come from? They didn't just appear out of nowhere. And where are solar panels coming from? <laughs> where is that lab-grown meat coming from? And uh, I think it's it's worthwhile for people to have an unvarnished view of where where science gets done, who is doing it, who gets credit for doing it, who's paying for it, what the quality of life is like for people doing those jobs, and also to intersperse it with uh, personal anecdotes about you know from a uh, from a, a, a nerdy introverted kid who ended up somehow at Harvard and Stanford and having a podcast that somehow I'm grateful to, you know, I'm, somehow people listen to and find, find interesting and I'm grateful for that. I'm sure that that is extremely useful because if you think about the, 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 in the era of fake news, so we should be having a healthy discussion on how things get done in, in a, from a science point of view and as well as the engineering point of view to see what it takes to get to the right place and, th and teaching someone to think logically is one of the duties that I believe that academicians have to the next gen generations. Yeah. So, but my next question comes to this. So you have, you're a PI who writes grants, you are, who writes who mentor students who in the sits in the panel of many, many um, academically relevant committees and you host a podcast, you have a YouTube channel. How do you manage your time? Like wh what does a typical day look like for you? Typical productive day look like for you? You don't want to be a sloppy scientist. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, you know, that's an interesting question before, you know, before the microphone started rolling, we were talking about like Tim Ferriss's productivity podcast. And uh, I, you know, I was, I was very interested in in like there was a time in my life not very long ago where I was probably before my we found out that we were going to have a kid uh, three years ago um, and uh, where I took product the productivity literature like the Cal Newport Tim Ferriss and uh, Peter Peter Drucker kind of like you know before that um, very very seriously productivity literature business literature and. I used to get on flights, like I used to fly 110,000 miles per year, um, and going to grant review panels, you know, uh, international conferences, stuff like that. And I really liked being busy. Like I really liked feeling important. I liked airline upgrades. I liked the uh, the <laughs> getting priority boarding. I liked having like uh, hotels and rental cars, like you know ha already have your information logged into the system and, and like yeah exactly like free rental days and stuff like that um even though i was charging grants for it anyway so it wouldn't have come out of pocket and i there were there would be times when i would be so excited to like okay in the time between wheels touching down in a new city and like getting into the uh, the the uber or the lyft or the or the taxi um how many emails can i fire off and like and and then i i realized that uh that that stuff was really degrading my my mental health and i think if some things are handled much more intelligently <laughs> And the goal of an email is not to get one email done as fast as possible, but the goal is to reduce the number of emails that come in in the future, like like getting the information out there that needs to be out there in as few keystrokes as possible and like to not trigger a flood of more emails. That's that's really important. Um, but I think um, I have like why hmm <laughs> I, I do not have a good answer for this how do how do i do it uh i have you know there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes like uh the my students are amazing and they do 
90% of the writing themselves. And I make, uh, you know, sometimes um, somewhat too cutting like of comments on their research papers, um, but I'm not doing their research for them. You know, I'm I'm like the 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 coach and the quality control valve and like the the strategic, um, you know, uh, the 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 person the the strategic consultant, I guess. Um, but, but like so, there were some years where we had like 15 original research papers come out and, you know, I, while a lot of the, like the words in the paper, like the sentence structure might've had my imprint on it. Like I wasn't like writing those papers, you know, really at all. Um, I mean, I was, I read probably 10, I, I went through probably 10 drafts of each one, but I didn't construct it, right? I didn't make most of the keystrokes myself. Um, and that is a, that is a key like aspect of, of, of how I can actually do these other things. Um, and the same thing is true in like grants and fellowship applications. I have a lot of students who have outside funding from um, NSF and DSEG, um, their, uh, their, their uh, home governments in some cases um, for international students. Um, I help them apply for fellowships and uh, I help them apply for uh, for for grants of the type that they get to be the PI on, like F thirty two grants in uh, in for NIH, and involving my students in as much of those processes as possible is really helpful. But I don't work a crazy schedule like a typical day. Like I work out every day. I play the piano at least ten minutes every day, um, and between 5 and 7 30 i'm uh i'm f f father to my two-year-old daughter and then from like uh set and that's in the evening and then at uh from 7 to 7 30 in the in the morning i get her ready and uh, my wife and i do it strictly alternate um basically every uh, child care task like meals and stuff like that um so yeah and then then like in the in the evening we might be like binging a, a show that uh, that will will watch maybe three nights a week um, but then I work at night uh, I so I get back on my laptop between you know 7 30 and 9 30 um, and those are those are my work hours uh, and then what's your favorite show what's your favorite show favorite show of all time or what am I watching now or maybe both <laughs> Favorite show of all time is Star Trek Deep Space Nine. <laughs> I, I know nothing about that, actually. Unfortunately, <laughs> I know nothing about I think I, I was born in a different place, so it's it's, it's different. I think <laughs> I, I can get that because any, most of the students I know, they they, have, they know about it. And I was like, okay, I keep silent when that topic starts. But what are you, what are you watching now then? Right now, we are watching The Expanse, um, which is, well people can it's 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 star trek era like 23rd century but there's no light speed so it all takes place within our solar system okay. and uh and it's very gritty and uh and in some cases uh, grotesque uh so far um but other you know other shows that uh, that i like um are, are not going to surprise anyone in your audience game of thrones mm -hmm. um uh uh, House of Cards before it turned out that um, uh, that Kevin Spacey was a creep. Yeah, and, I can say um, I can say the same thing. Uh, until third season, it was really good, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> first season is the best one of House of Cards, I would say. Yeah, but so is that is that your unplugging routine, like watching or binging the show? Is that how you unplug from work, or that helps you um, to to focus on other things? Uh, that uh, that playing the piano and uh, exercising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those things. I, I have a, a little bit of like a, you know, like a, uh, a, you know, a meditation practice. And I almost like hesitate to say that because of like how much of like a, you know, uh, 
I don't know, singling kind of douchebag at me. <laughs> makes me no, sound like, I don't think so. But actually. like, See, this is what crazes me the most. Like, you know, at like who doesn't have an imposter syndrome? Like, it's very hard to say, right? Like, because anytime you talk to someone, they will be like, "Oh, I don't want to let this this information of me go outside," which which prevents a lot of people to putting content on, on, online. Like, even for me, it was like for for a for a few months i debated whether should i start it or not so yeah it's a hard it, it decision changes. right yeah yeah and like the the meditation thing right now it's not that important in my life but there were times when it was very important um but i i think in terms of like maslow's hierarchy of needs for me it's like sleep and i'm working on that now it's not it's not easy um sleep diet and exercise and making sure that i get to spend time with my uh my wife and daughter and then when those things are are satisfied and uh and i and then i i do more like mindful practice and i don't mean to disparage the uh, the practice at all because i've been doing it with you know somewhat regularly uh for uh for for six years but there's definitely like what uh what white dude with a podcast doesn't meditate and uh and i i kind of regret that uh that association and i it's sort of like <laughs> dave matthews band in the 1990s like i couldn't admit to liking it because i resented the the fans but now you know i like dave matthews band and i meditate a couple times a week yeah that, that's good to know i mean many people will have the time to you know they would not be able to admit something like that but yeah you are being very really brave yeah we call that the, they call that toxic mas- masculinity right uh, you, can't, is it? <laughs> uh, you can't admit the uh the and you are connection the perfect to to other people and yeah and, and, you're in the perfect church. position as well like you are in california as well that adds up a lot more stereotypes to <laughs> to the <laughs> meditation right. aspect of it. That, that's right we have the beach i i meditate on the beach during my run <laughs> yeah there there we go <laughs> wow <laughs> that was a surprise to me <laughs> all right so uh let me ask you this what are your suggestions for the next upcoming scientist who wants to to start an academic job what are your advices for them my uh, there was a there there is a tv show um i don't know if it's still on it was uh, it might be still on uh, good eats by alton brown and he uh he's also prominent in other aspect other shows on the food network uh but he was um he had other jobs in his life and he was kind of like disappointed and underwhelmed by the quality of cooking tv shows and he said i could do this way way better and one time i saw a, an interview with him um probably in like 2007 on a cnbc show called the big idea with donny deutsch who's an advertising executive and he and and donny deutsch asked uh, elton brown how did you you know how did you know that you wanted to do this and he he gave his his story and he's like yeah but he pro deeper how did how did you know that you were going to be the one to do this and he said whenever you do something where you put yourself out there in front of people and that could be in uh publications the lecture hall grant proposal writing you are selling yourself as a product and you have to have a sober assessment of where your skills line up against other people's and make sure and now I'm using my words but captures Alton Brown sentiment that you are using the sharpest arrows in your quiver and not trying to be second best at somebody else's game so even if you don't perceive there to be a field in the at the nexus of what you're good at and what you want to contribute to try to make that feel <laughs> like try to try to exploit what you're good at um which may not be like what you're passionate about but but figure out like where your skills line up and try to figure out a way to apply what you're good at to what you're passionate about in the highly likely case where what you're good at and what you're passionate about are not the same thing because <laughs> eventually like if you're if you're good at it you will become you know passionate about it So like you said earlier um 
my the current directions of my research lab like we're we still have a, lots of activity in mechanical properties of organic semiconductors and mechanical biosensors but like kind of this out there pie in the sky thing is in haptics but but when i the papers that i'm most excited to review and the grant proposals i'm most excited to review are definitely on mechanical properties of semiconducting polymers and structure property relationships and like physical organic studies of these materials, because even though when I was an undergraduate, I didn't know what a conjugated polymer was, I certainly didn't know that I would be interested in mechanical properties. It's just what, what I'm good at now, what I'm like, what I feel like I have a, uh, an advantage in compared to other people in the field. And that's what I, what I feel good about the, about, about doing. Yeah. That's an excellent piece of advice for budding scientists. One of the things I think I learned from that is like you, what you need to know is that you need to know yourself to, to use that, like to understand your skill set. you need to take the time off or like to find out what you're good at. Then you have to apply yeah. yourself towards something which would be more useful. There's right? another professor that has a podcast. His name is Tyler Cowan. He's at George mm -hmm. Mason University and has a podcast conversations with Tyler. I actually interviewed him on molecular podcasting. He was my highest profile guest, but he calls what you're talking about metacognition. Um, applied, wow. you know, medic, so uh, where, where you know your own skills and you know where to push on your, uh, you know, where, what the sharpest arrows in your quiver are and uh, how to apply them to problems so that you can make a difference as opposed to banging your head against the wall competing with people that are better at you know whatever at you there will always be something that you are best at and that might be at the intersection between a few different uh areas yep that brings out to me to the last question you one of your podcasts you mentioned that you like to cook posto how did that happen I've always liked working with my hands and I used to uh, some of my fondest memories from like childhood, but this is like later childhood, I would say 11, 12, or it would be like baking <laughs> from this, uh, this, destroyed version of Betty Crocker's like handbook <laughs> that we called dad's grail diary. It was my mom's cookbook, but we called it dad's grail diary as uh, in reference to Indiana Jones and the last crusade where the diary is this, uh, this, uh, this item that changes hands between the heroes and the Nazis throughout the movie. But I would make like, recipes from, from that cookbook and they all i'm sure turned out like they were tasty because they had sugar and butter in them but you know they <laughs> what can they probably probably were not that <laughs> they're probably not that good but then uh i got really into cooking um in grad school uh i a lot a lot of what i uh what i cook is um like where most of the flavor is is in south asia and central america <laughs> and oh, so that's, I, that's I, such a combination i cook uh let's say i hesitate to say this uh in in front of you i i, I cook uh indian food i went to <laughs> um i went to uh uh india on a, a trip to um in uh, in grad school and i ate the best that i've ever ate eaten ever and i wanted to learn how to do that so I, i've taken that quite seriously um oh. and uh and i make a lot of like mexican inspired uh food but just like at home you know <laughs> well yeah that's fun to know actually like because i was very curious because i i did my undergrad in in west bengal where posto is a real thing. Like people love posto. I mean, I had a previous roommate who loves cooking posto. But then I, when I listened to your podcast and when I heard posto, I was like, oh, you are also really into this. That, because it's not an easy thing to make. It, it, it's very simple, right? It has, a lot, it has literally nothing. That's ma that makes it even harder to make. So when you have, <laughs> like in, in Indian food, you just throw in a ton of masala and some, most of the times it will taste good. But when yeah. you don't have the masala, 
then it's a problem. Like, you know, when, when there's less, less spice involved, then it's a problem to cook. <laughs> so somebody, somebody asked me in, a, in my class the other day, um, do you wish that you could go into the lab more? And I said, uh, not really for a number of reasons, like opportunity cost. I don't know where stuff is. I'll break stuff. Um, I probably should be spending my time like writing grants and paying for my students who actually know how to do experiments, whereas I like haven't done stuff in a long time. Um, but then, but I get that fix of working with my hands in other ways in my life. So like the ideal Saturday for me is going either to Home Depot or to the international grocery store. So we have a, we have a great like um, uh, Indian supermarket close to our house where you can get things like, uh, like loofah and oh, wow. uh, bitter gourd and drumsticks and just awesome like produce that's inexpensive and the staff is really knowledgeable and they have every whole spice and ground spice and every kind of rice you could possibly imagine and yogurt that comes in gallon <laughs> yeah that's fun <laughs> yeah i mean i'm also surprised that i mean when i was in ohio then when i go to the indian store i don't get a lot of things what i want but here now i'm in new jersey it was like almost the capital of india so where i go and to the indian store and i get everything i need whatever i, I can get from india so yeah let, let, let me know when you go next time to to South India, I can ask my parents to host you. Then you nice. can have the the, <laughs> the the traditional way of banana leaf and like you know have the food in it. That that'll be fun when awesome. when everything comes back to normal. <laughs> sure yeah, thing. with that, yeah, thank you so much for your time. I mean, you have been a pleasure to talk to. Let's. I think we should do a round two at some point. I would be. Yeah. I would be happy to. Thank you, Amal. It was yeah. a great. Thank fun. you so much. Yep. Same here.